Edwin and Jean Green. Uh, Edwin Green is an alumnus of Springfield College. And this photo for the students in the audience probably looks familiar to you. That is the Health Science Center room 224. There was a time every year where uh, uh, Edwin and Jean Green would come back to campus. And in coming back to campus for their alumni visit, they would make sure that they stopped into the physical therapy program to talk with the students. Not because either of them were physical therapists, but because both of them had experienced the amazing work that physical therapists can do to help people restore their mobility. And we are really grateful to Edwin and Jean Green for endowing this lectureship and letting us bring really noted scholars in physical therapy every year. So the Green Lecture, as I just pointed out, is an annual lecture by a noted researcher, somebody whose work really influences the field of physical therapy. And it's our premier lectureship in the department. The lectureship is, uh, the lecturer is selected by the faculty in particular, a uh, lot of work done to get this off the ground by our research committee. So I wanna thank uh, Dr. Don Roberts and Dr. Regina Kaufman, who are both members of the research committee along with me. At the same time, I wanna acknowledge all of the faculty who work very hard to bring about the lecture and make sure that uh, the logistics work out and that our lecture is uh, a noted, uh, is not only a noted researcher, but someone who really provides some guidance about the future of physical therapy. And so our faculty include uh, Dr. Sami Brooks, Dr. Maureen Barrett, Dr. Liz Montemagny, Dr. Gina Kaufman, Dr. Kim Nowakowski, Dr. Kathy Pappas, and Dr. Aaron Futrell. The person behind the scenes who makes all of this happen is our administrative associate, Cindy Moriarty, and so we're really indebted and grateful for her assistance in pulling this off. I did take a peek at the participant list, and I can't help but uh, noting that this is an, not only is this an unusual year because we're virtual, it's an unusual year because virtual lets previous green lecturers be in the audience. And I did notice that at least one of our previous green lecturers is here. Uh, Dr. Becky Craig, who was a lecturer in 2002 is in the audience. I'm hopeful that others are joining us. Every year uh, past previous green lecturers are invited back to join us uh, to hear the, the, the words of, of the next lecturer. This is an amazing list if you're a physical therapist and you're looking at this list, or if you're a student and you're thinking, wait, I've read articles by these people. Um, a lot of them have the initials FAPTA after their name because they are fellows because of the amount of, of, of contribution they've made in, in the, uh, to our profession. Many of them have been editors on our journal. Many of them have had all types of influence in the profession. And so we're really grateful that we can bring this group to our campus. I'd also like to thank some of the other guests who are here tonight. Uh, just to let you know, Dr. Shields, uh, in the audience is uh, our provost, Dr. Martha Potvin, uh, some other uh, uh, staff from the Academic Affairs Office, uh, our dean, uh, Dr. Brooke Hallowell, and uh, we're really grateful, as always, to have the support of Sue London, who is a member of our Board of Trustees and is a physical therapist. So our green lecturer tonight is uh, um, uh, Dr. Richard Shields. Uh, Dr. Shields is, uh, has a lot of titles. I'm jealous, I guess, except that I'm not jealous because every title comes with lots of responsibility. So he's chair and department executive officer of the Department of Physical Therapy and Rehab Science. He is also the Gary L. Soderberg Endowed Professor in Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Science and Professor of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Science all at the Carver College of Medicine at the University of Iowa. And I'm sure that for the students in the audience, he can tell you who Gary Soderberg is, another very influential name in, in physical therapy education. Dr. Shields received his bachelor's degree in biology from Catawba College, a post-baccalaureate degree in physical therapy from the Mayo Clinic, a master's degree in exercise physiology, and a PhD in exercise physiology from the University of Iowa. He managed the acute care, the acute spinal cord injury program at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics for several years and developed a number of lines of research that focused on the impact of exercise on various tissues, including muscle, bone, metabolism, and cognitive health in people with and without central nervous system injury or disease. He hold, he's written numerous research articles. He holds medical device patents from inventions that he's designed to, to log and deliver therapeutic stress to the tissues of people with paralysis. 
His clinical research strives to improve the health of people who suffer from reduced activity due to paralysis, obesity, injury, or age. He's extremely well-funded, funded through the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Veterans Affairs, as well as several private foundations. He's been the recipient of many prestigious awards in our profession, and uh, students have read at least two different articles that he's written, one on the area of epigenetics, the other in the area of student debt. And that gives you a sense of the breadth of his scholarly work. So this evening, he's joining us as our green lecturer, and I'm gonna turn the floor over to him and to Dr. Campbell. They're gonna engage in some conversation. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and uh, Dr. Roberts and I will be handling the Q&A and make sure that the panelists is here. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Shields. Thank you for hosting Dr. Campbell. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Angela Campbell, professor of physical therapy in the Department of Physical Therapy here at Springfield College. I'm chair of our professional behavior committee. Um, and I just hope that somehow tonight, if you were gonna do a visual analog scale between Oprah Winfrey uh, interviewing Prince Harry and Megan and, Megan, and uh, Zach Galifianakis between two ferns, I'm a little bit closer hope for, hopefully to Oprah Winfrey. So. Um, so with that, I, I do have to really say that I have been so impressed looking at the scope of your and breadth of your research. I, it's, it's amazing that you can have someone that not only sees the trees, but you really examine that subcellular particle of those trees, but yet you see the entire forest. Um, so the first question is, you know, especially as a clinician, boots on the ground, working with patients with spinal cord injury, to becoming a researcher of that very condition. Can you tell us a little bit about that pathway and how you've evolved in your career? Yeah, sure. And, and let me first just thank you all for this um, honor to really present to, or have the opportunity to engage in this kind of a conversation in an informal way with uh, Springfield College that has a phenomenal reputation all over the, the world, if you will. And um, so thank you for that. And I do want to recognize the Greens because uh, without their investment in this program, many of those great speakers, we would have never uh, had the opportunity to hear from. So <clears throat> in answer to your question, you know, I took a, a path that probably is not a path that I often recommend. Um, and it, it, you know, it served me well, but in, in retrospect, there was always, I was probably at a high risk of maybe not going on into academia or something like that, because the path that I took as a clinician, um, involved research and, but it didn't involve research because I was doing a structured degree. It involved research because I had questions. And I started to, to um, answer some of those questions or try to, and I ran into all sorts of roadblocks. And the roadblocks were because I didn't know how to analyze data. I didn't know how to write. I didn't know how to put together a good sound hypothesis. I didn't know how to write grants. And um, suddenly, you know, I started taking things, courses that I thought I needed to answer a question that I was trying to address clinically. I was an old, always an avid um, measurement person. I liked data. And so I started to accumulate data on various questions. And it, it, it took me down the path of just taking courses. And at some point along the way, one of the faculty that were not in the clinic pulled me aside and they said, how many, how many credit hours have you taken? I said, I don't know. I just keep taking courses that I think I need. And he looked and he said, you're, you're really close to having a PhD. Um, so that was the path I took. It was very uh, structured towards the questions I was asking. And not only within the clinic, but then as a, a clinical instructor. So that's how I, I, I got into it. And fortunately, I was at the University of Iowa, where in 1981, 
you know, there were seven PhD faculty there doing research. And so once I segued into the, the didactic programs, it was the perfect place to be to do that. So that's how I bridge from the clinic. And I still consider myself a clinician today. I go over to ICU, I evaluate people who've had acute spinal cord injury. I enroll them in studies and I still consult. Um, so my roots, I, you know, I never want to give up that clinical side because, you know, sometimes uh, people go towards the PhD and never really experience the clinical side, but that really came with my PhD, if you will, uh, work. So that's how I got to this point. Can you follow up a little bit in, in thinking about, we have a lot of students here in the audience tonight, um, some of whom are graduating very soon at, or in the next year or two. And thinking how, how did that, you know, you were at University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, which is a big organization, but not often does that clinical, that clinician get to do that clinical research. How important was it for you to be at a facility like University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics to be able to do that? Like you said, you kind of stumbled along and made your own path. Um, but there were, you know, they were those sort of landing pads that allowed you to do that. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. And the times were different. We were still in a fee for service primarily in terms of um, payment systems. And there was tremendous revenues that were coming in through clinical dollars that allowed people to do scholarship during their work time at, here at Iowa at that time. So there's no question, uh, you know, for students, I think, you know, there, there are many ways I could have gone and I would have been happy. And I think that's the important question. It's not, you know, these aren't such pivotal decisions. They're more, you know, what, what makes you happy? And when you leave work each day, do you walk home or do you leave saying, yeah, I feel like I did something good. And, um, you know, whether I, I went one route or the other, I think I could have been extremely happy in, a, in several landing spots. And, and like you said, I was fortunate maybe to be at Iowa because I had that opportunity to develop some things, collect some data in the clinic. But I would also advise um, students to realize you can do research anywhere, anytime, any place, because all it is is it, if you start to accumulate information in some form a little at a time at six months, one year, two year, five years. Um, I was always a saver of data and it, it didn't matter what it was, like we developed the Iowa level of assistance scale. And I did that my second year out of PT school so that when I was working with students, we, we all used the same language when we said standby assistance or moderate assistance or maximal assistance. And there are so many opportunities and with uh, new graduates and they're so, so bright, so much smarter than I ever was. And, you know, they can start to aggregate their own, you've heard, you know, Tony Delito and others talk about the baseball card. They can start to aggregate their signature in the profession and they wanna know where they stand relative to everybody else in, in getting people uh, back to full functioning. So while, you know, a big institution offers some advantages, um, the, the enthusiasm about data and what it means and what it can help you learn about yourself in terms of the truth is I think the most important concept. And I'd encourage all graduates to, to think about that regardless of where they go to practice, research, will be a part of their practice. Thank you for that. That was, that was very insightful. Do you have a, you know, especially starting, I, I listened in your uh, 2017 Macmillan lecture, I listened to you talk about a couple of patients that were very inspirational. Was it a patient that inspired you to really study about spinal cord? Was there any particular patient you can share enough about to, to 
say how those clinical questions really percolated? Yeah, I, you know, I think you are an Oprah Winfrey with the, the way you're, <laughs> you're uh, positioning these questions. This is, this is, that's a great question because it's going to, um, it's going to cause me to, to provide an answer that I don't think I've really ever offered before. And that was growing up, um, we, you know, I was from a family of nine and, you know, there were, um, it was needless to say there was some chaos at times, okay? But um, I can remember, you know, we would dive out of trees into a, a creek, if you will, in New Jersey. And, and we would do it at night. Now it was hardly a, a good decision or anything like that. But one night a friend of mine actually dove and hit a, a log in the water and broke his neck. And that was my first exposure to how quickly you lose the ability to control, at, you know, 18 years old, um, you know, most of these folks are, are, you know, have an 18 year old mind and a body that suddenly becomes 70 years old or worse. And so that was my first exposure. And then, you know, you're right on the money with the, you know, two very strategic patients. One has passed away and the other one, you know, is still a part of my research lab. But um, the first individual who had the amputation and he was literally amputated at L4 because his extremities were so foul smelling and infected. And it just, I mean, I can remember the day that, you know, after his surgery, I said, we can do better than this. You know, we, we have to do better than this. Um, because, you know, when tissue that loses its neural innervation um, just becomes an appendage that now can lead to infection and further disability. Um, that's, that's due to care. And, um, you know, so that's when, you know, I really started to get into what are the physiological changes in tissue um, that happens after the injury? And can we try to prevent it and develop methods to do that? The second client I had is a C6 quadriplegic and at the Macmillan lecture, I showed video of him uh, and you know he's approaching 60 years old and he is as active today as he was when he was 16. But he learned good skills. I was able to rehab him and probably all my research and all the publications and all the grants, the truth be known, the most powerful thing I've probably done was to rehab people to their full potential. Uh, and, and then to be able to see it um, maintained over a lifetime. Because we look at somebody who's paralyzed and only moving 20% of their muscle mass, and we off, often throw in the towel like, well, moving 20% of your muscle for 30 years isn't going to have any benefit. But I don't think we know that. And I think, you know, we have some examples of people who have sustained the use of that 20% and they do quite well. And so, you know, as I look back, you know, those are probably my biggest accomplishments actually and influenced me most. Yeah, wow, that's that's tremendous. Um, so thinking a little bit more, you know, you started with, with this passion inspired by by this tragedy in some ways and you saw what the potential was for these human beings but from what i heard in your Macmillan lecture it sounds like that aspect of prescribing exercise um for i think it was mr j in in your Macmillan lecture lecture really um drove to this path of looking at exercise as a way to help uh frame the epigenetics of our patients. Can you talk a little bit about that transition? I mean, that's a that's a big turn, right? That that's that's a, a lot of meandering to get there. And then once you started to really go down that pathway, uh, if you could talk about your research collaborators, because a lot of them are outside of physical therapy, and how you were able to build this team that has been so successful in publications. And really, you know, bringing that bench work to to clinical practice. 
Yeah, I mean, that's again, really um, an insightful question because, <clears throat> you know, as complicated as things look in terms of, wow, he's digging into these, you know, the, down to the mechanisms of how genes are getting tagged. Um, and for the students in the audience, it's important to, to realize, you know, um, what, what opened that question was some principles of training that I was interested in as a student, even, even as I remember reading a paper as a student at the Mayo Clinic that actually uh, put in my mind some of these hypotheses that ended up relating to gene function and all that. But, um, and it really came back to um, oxidative systems, meaning you know, we all know about aerobic pathways and anaerobic pathways. And, um, you know, what I was very interested in was whether or not if we create more slow twitch oxidative fibers, um, is that a healthier phenotype than if we create um, atrophied fast twitch fibers? And I asked that question because what I learned early on after spinal cord injury, oxidative muscles become atrophied sprinters muscles. So to, to mm -hmm. put it simply, slow oxidative fibers transform all of them, even your soleus, which is normally 80% slow and endurant, it moves by one year into a fast fatigable phenotype and it's atrophied. And, um, you know, I was, I was really enthralled with that concept and then uh, uh, I read a paper, you know, years ago um, out of Harvard, it was Siegelman's lab, and he showed that animals, if you upregulate a very powerful gene that controls the oxidative capability of skeletal muscle, these mice lived forever, they didn't develop uh, metabolic disease, they didn't put on weight, they didn't do all these things, and it's like, wow, it makes some sense that skeletal muscle is, is a transducer that probably signals the whole body about the state of the machinery, right? So if you have a machine that isn't working versus a machine that's, that is working, it has to be using skeletal muscle. And so it turns out, you know, my, what, I, what I went and took courses in in the late 80s was in uh, electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. So I biopsied human um, paralyzed muscle in the 80s, looked at it under microscope, fiber typed it, because those were the only techniques we had. We had slow fibers or fast fibers. We were at the histochemistry level, and then we could look at the ultrastructure using electron microscopy. And so, you know, I was kind of the first one that showed that this muscle transforms and becomes fast, atrophied, and fatigable after the injury. And I thought, does that contribute to their diabetes? Does that contribute to some of these secondary problems? And then you say, well, you know, well, how did you get to the gene side and actually tagging genes? All that happened was, and this is a, I think this is a wonderful lesson. All that happened was that techniques to study things changed from the 80s. You know, we had no, you know, it was millions and millions of dollars to do any kind of genotyping in the year 2000. And by 2009, the price started to come down. And so some of the same principles of trying to understand what regulates skeletal muscle in becoming oxidative or keeping the oxidative properties could then be studied at the gene level. And then of course the human genome came out and we could do all that, but then the problem was it wasn't just at the gene level, it's what's mm -hmm. controlling the genes and that's the epigenome. And so, you know, I guess, you know, part of it is a, a geneticist in the 1990s that didn't keep up 
um, is probably not as good as somebody who stays up with things uh, as they change. That's how fast uh, capabilities change. And so it's a good lesson, you know, if I was, I stopped doing fiber typing in the 90s because I answered my question and I didn't have anything more to answer. I started doing biopsies again once we could look at the molecular and could look at the genetics. Then there was a reason to do it. And so um, that's how I, I kind of migrated that pathway. It wasn't that complicated question to begin with. It just carried over to you know, when I could then take a sample and look at 20,000 genes in skeletal muscle and see what exercise did to them, um, then it became clear that it was very powerful that, that you know, the genetic um, crosstalk and some of the other things were, were a, a very powerful thing to investigate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really amazing. Um especially the students. So I, in my clinical areas in cardiovascular and pulmonary physical therapy, and my students, they hear me all the time talk about, for example, the Wasserman model and how much the changes that we're making are on the peripheral level with the skeletal muscle. And so they've heard me talk time and time again about how in, in patients with COPD and patients with advanced cystic fibrosis and patients with advanced heart failure, they have these decreased proportion of these type one oxidative fibers and how important exercise is to make some of those fiber type changes. Um, but I don't know if you could talk a little bit more about how you're, you really are posing to physical therapists and giving this, this challenge um, about helping patients flip the switch, right? In their genome. And in particular, uh, that especially with my background in critical care, you know, we have a history of underdosing our patients. Um, and so I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that, of how to really bring forward this to the clinical practice and what you envision and hope for down the road with this. Yeah, I, you know, I think there are two things, you know, we used to always think, well, here's an acquired uh, disease and here's an inherited disease. And medical genetics was, you know, always about inherited disease. But what we never even fully appreciated is someone who inherits a disease, let's say uh, muscular dystrophy. Um, even with that disease, the epigenetic system is influencing what their phenotype is going to look like within the guidelines of that um, uh, genetic um, disease, if you will. And so, you know, it, it it opens the door to say, you know, we, we should be less about comparing to what is normal and more about comparing our own delta over life. So in other words, if I have muscular dystrophy and I'm going to live 15 years, um, how can I do that in the best um, quality of life and so forth that I possibly can? And what we see is that the epigenome is a way to tag that. And I think a beautiful way to interface this, because it's easy to talk about epigenetics and lose everybody, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, probably some of the students are saying, okay, here he goes down that epigenetic path, right? But mm -hmm. honestly, if you think about it, how do we get paid? I mean, right now in healthcare, we get paid using ICD-10 codes. And I mean, if you, and that's a, that's a medical diagnosis, you know, it might be ankle sprain, but the beauty of that system is it's also integrated now with the ICF, the International Classification of Function and Disability. And that's where, that's where the gold is. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with epigenetics? All those factors in the ICF model are environmental. The social determinants of health are regulating genes. They're turning them on, they're turning them off. Um, you know, nutrition, diet, exercise, sleep, circadian rhythm, uh, alcohol, 
you know, and so it, it brings us right to the heart of patient centered care. And that's that. In, in other words, I get upset when a physician will have me fill something out and it says, you know, the physician wants to know all these things like, do you drink socially and how many, you know, per week, how many this, because that creates the framework of maybe some intervention. I believe that a physical therapist, when they prescribe, you know, if I'm trying to hypertrophy muscle and somebody is drinking a six pack a night, mm -hmm. I know that we now know that epigenetically that really inhibits the development of protein synthesis pathway. So I may have to use some different strategies for someone. And that's what makes care today patient centered because it's about, you know, how often do we say, when is the best time, if you were going to exercise, when would it be? And I, I when I ask that question, they say, oh, after two <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon, I'm done. I'll never exercise then. Okay, let's build your program around when it's optimal for your circadian rhythm. And we know that gene expression and epigenetic regulation changes on a 24 hour cycle. And that's why hormonal levels and everything else. But I think it, it forces us to think comprehensively about the client and not just treat with blinders on. And so, you know, epigenetics can be as complicated as we wanna make it. And I can delve mm -hmm. into the methylation and demethylation. But that's not where physical therapists need to go. They need to understand the underlying framework for how it can be a very powerful regulator, the environmental influences of somebody's phenotype. And the last point on that is some would suggest that if you can explain that to clients, that clients have control of some of their genetic destiny that we will be more successful in changing behaviors rather than just say, okay, do this 30 minutes and hold your heart rate at this level. And they say, right. And then, mm -hmm. you know, we leave 20% being compliant and 80% not being compliant. So. Yeah. 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 It was amazing. I was going to ask you about social determinants of health, because, you know, if you're working so hard to flip the switch on, and you have all these other factors that are bringing it down, then, then we're not setting patients up for success, like you mentioned. So I think that's a fabulous way to think about it, uh, especially given I feel like a lot of medicine, a lot of physicians are being pushed to really explore this 80% of health that's determined by things other than traditional medical care. Um, so can you uh, talk about, uh, speaking of physicians, some of your collaboration with the Department of Internal Medicine, like how is this fitting in, um, you know, your influence, for example, on the medical community to look at physical therapists as practitioners of choice for patients with movement disorder? I don't know if your research and your practice has been beneficial in that domain. I would, I would think so, but I'll let you tell that story. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you know, any of, of my ability to move a field forward is because of the people around me. I mean, there's no, there's no question about that. I mean, first and foremost, I've been able to mentor 24 PhD students. And each and every one of those students in that give and take process have prompted ideas and discussion and so forth. And, and not just PhD students, DPT students. I mean, you know, DPT students that I work with, I mean, the beauty is, you know, when somebody isn't already contaminated with all the science, it's, you know, you get some of the best questions like, well, what about this? And, you know, sometimes we're so close to things that we, we fail to um, open doors because we're used to the dogma. And so what I really appreciate is, you know, having students put things together without any structure, without any close editing, 
and say, you, this is yours. Tell me, tell me how you came to this. And so, you know, I think um, all of the, the personnel, it's a, it's a two way street. I've never looked at it like, okay, I'm providing, you know, it's stump the stars. I'm putting everything out and they're all, you know, getting stumped. It's, it's, it's always been a two way street and that's where it's very collegial. But within the college, we have that same uh, collegial attitude. I can remember, I called um, uh, Chris Adams, he's an MD, PhD, phenomenal um, individual. Um, and I called him, I said, I have 10 people that I hypertrophied their right calf and they're, they're paralyzed and they don't wanna stop it. Right, so they have one big calf and they have one calf that never trained. And I started it within weeks after their spinal cord injury and they're three years post. And the study ended and they were like, we're not stopping this. This is part, you know, and I said, well, why? And they said, my bowel program works so much better. If I miss when I get sick, if I don't train that one calf and I'm thinking, well, then that calf must be signaling to other systems. And so there's something good about even a little bit of, of muscle activation. So I called Chris Adams and I said, you know, I, I've got to either get this IRB extended or do something, but this is a very novel um, set of, of um, samples and clients. And he's the one that introduced me to uh, how to do the gene expression studies. And mm -hmm. I've got to be honest, I mean, without having that door at that time, because I had these clients and I say, boy, I've read your work in molecular, you know, how hard would it be for us to, to genotype these people and really understand a novel model where we control the activity for three years? They're clearly hypertrophied, they're clearly endurant. Can we, can we do that? And so that was really, you know, fundamental because that opened the door to the genetic side of, of things. And um, we went on, believe it or not, we published a paper together in um, cell metabolism, which has an impact wow. factor of like, you know, 40 <laughs> or something. But um, what we did is, I won't go into the detail, but because of that model, we could see what substances were correlated to genes associated with hypertrophy. And mm -hmm. one, one substance kept coming up and um, it, it was ursolic acid. And we we're like, what is this ursolic acid? You know, we found a special compound associated with muscle hypertrophy. And when we looked closer and closer, it's in apple peels. And that was the paper we published in, in you know, you know, we, we published a paper on a, on a compound in a, something that we've said for years, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But it was so ironic that it was the spinal cord injured model that helped him advance something. It helped me advance something. And that was part of that, that collaboration that really um, was very, very helpful and is very collaborative here in the College of Medicine. There's a question, follow-up question that came into the chat is, you know, how do you see some of this, this great work in epigenetics? How do you see it being applied on a larger scale in, in, in the clinical setting? You know, thinking about, for example, an outpatient physical therapy uh, clinic, how do you see some of this work coming into play there? Yeah, and again, I don't think, um, I mean, we when we talk about precision physical therapy or precision health or precision medicine, in, in my case, it would be pre precision physical therapy. Um, it's, it's that we're a consumer of the potential for these other factors. And I'll give you a, a good example in orthopedics. What's sweeping the country are, um, you know, it's not completely funded yet, but it's, you know, it, our stem cell work, right? I mean, people, who have resources are paying to have stem cells, you know, put in their osteoarthritic knees. Um, 
I believe that stem cell work will be, when I was in, in the 80s, they used to pop the meniscus out, you know, the minute they thought it was torn, they would just take the whole thing out. Today, we now know that all those folks have severe, you know, osteoarthritis and so forth. Um, someday we'll look back somebody and maybe these students will be part of this group that will look back and say i can't believe they used to cut off the head of the femur and put an appliance in to replace that because when when arthritis gets to be grade two or even it, you know what epigenetics says is it's preventive it's lifestyle it's environmental influences um to a joint and the use of perhaps stem cells, how you treat those stem cells, the environment that they're in will determine their fate. When you take a stem cell and you put it in a sick environment, an environment where let's say the person has got metabolic disease or you know the uh, metabolism is a huge regulator of stem cells and the epigenetics of stem cells. So, for the first time, who's going to be the best candidate for the first trials to try to repair articular cartilage? Um, people who have a lifestyle that is conducive to the support of those cellular therapies. So that's just one example where right in the field of outpatient orthopedics, when somebody comes in, what's their aerobic status? when they're going to have a, a stem cells put into an osteoarthritic knee. All those conditions we're learning influence the health of that stem cell. At the bench, we can, we can promote stem cells to do anything, but when we put them in a sick environment, because we, we take our eye off of all these other environmental factors, including the social determinants. I mean, along those lines, we have, I mean, not we, but the scientific community has nicely identified the, um, the adverse stress genes in response to socioeconomic stressors. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're now called the adversity gene. And so, you know, so there will be analyses probably done on who's going to be the best candidate to have some of these therapies. And physical therapy is behavioral, it's environmental. What we prescribe is for a lifetime or for a long duration. And so um, it's not that physical therapists will need to be able to read genetic analyses, it's that physical therapists come away with the foundational principles of the power of what's contributing to the health and well-being of tissues because you know they're at the at the heart of that so you know i i have another example that we've used that i've actually been able to develop an intervention um using genetics to say oh my gosh i never realized that stimulating muscle without generating force regulates genes that are associated with hypertrophy. Our dogma has said, if you don't overload, you can't hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's as we develop new tools, we can start to question our own dogma by um, having precision studies say, oh my gosh, you can turn these genes on that are involved with hypertrophy with a very low load if they're driven the right way. And that's using electrically induced um, activation. Sure. So wow. there's another question here in the chat box. Um, while I'm reading it, uh, before I read it, I'll, I'll have you even follow up and th I'll have you think about this while I'm answering the question, because maybe you would don't want, you can decline this one. Um, the other big area of research that I know is not your area, so that's why I said, if you don't want to comment and don't feel you can comment, that'll be okay, is um is looking at blood flow restriction training and i know that i've been following a little bit of that research and where they talk about these conditions and a way to uh, help change that microclimate in a way that help can help 
produce muscular effects. And I don't know if you have any insight or thoughts of how that's going to be framing epigenetics as well. But before, before I have you uh, think about that, I'll, I'll ask this question uh, from Dr. Regina Coffin. Is the ability to influence the epigenetic processes altered by health conditions? Does a person with a spinal cord injury, for example, have a different potential for responsiveness than say a person with Parkinson's or a person with diabetes versus an otherwise healthy person? Yeah, so that's a great question. And you know, while a definitive study hasn't actually done that, I'll, I'll give you my um, impression. The longer that an environmental condition that is adverse is exposed to the cell, the more ingrained that epigenetic tagging becomes. Remember, epigenetic tagging can be good or it can be bad. So the longer one is atrophied, it's much more difficult than to untag those genes. And so, you know, and, and let me flip that another way. We always think about our intervention being, oh, well, eight weeks and we get hypertrophy or 16 weeks. We've missed the boat on that because what the reason a lot of these people train for 12 weeks and then they quit is because that's way under the optimum for when you start to tag genes. In other words, you can upregulate and get a phenotype change, but the actual memory component of tagging in our data shows that you got to get out to a year. And so it's not mm -hmm. until a year where now you've ingrained something where you've tagged it. So now if you stop doing it, it's going to it's going to keep operating for a few months because of that memory. So the question is really good because, I mean, I would love to have that across the disability spectrum of responsiveness to epigenetics. But what we have learned is if you take somebody who's been spinal cord injured for 15 years, that means those muscles have been fast and fatigable for all that time to reconstruct the oxidative capability and to actually tag things epigenetically, we're getting into one, three to five year studies. And that's why doing something over a lifetime has to be viewed as a very powerful thing. It doesn't have to be how much you did this week. It has to be how much you've sustained over the, the months, years, and decades. And um, that's, that's really the, what epigenetics is opening the door to. And so a lot of times when we induce change short-term, like most of our clinical trials are 12 weeks. Well, that's great, but we probably didn't actually get to the most formidable impact, which mm -hmm. would be regulating the epigenome, which is way down, downstream. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, obviously longer than our traditional episode of care as physical therapists. But the other thing, you, one of the other themes you mentioned in the McMillan lecture was that this idea of, um, I, don't, I don't think you called it exactly patient satisfaction, but these patient-centered outcomes. Um, I don't know if you can talk a little bit broader about how, you know, you were, have been interested in this, you know, this is, that's a forest question now, right? So yep. we're getting away from these trees and thinking, you know, you, all these demands on us as physical therapists, but we have to produce outcomes and show value. I don't know if you want to speak a little bit about that, that role and those thinking that you've had about how we can expand that role and be yeah. assessed. Because like you said, Tony DeLeader, right? Looking at the, the, you might need to refresh these guys' memories. Most of these students had never heard about that, about your baseball player stats, right? Your tops card and how, yeah. how, how are you as a physical therapist? Yeah, I mean, that concept of having your own data. I mean, the beauty of baseball, it's all in the back of a card, a whole person's career. So what's your career look like as a physical therapist in terms of your outcomes relative to others? And that's the beauty of a batting average in baseball. But what's, um, what's interesting about, um, you know, your, your last question is, I can answer it probably in a, in a 
most constructive way by putting forth the importance of measuring the expectations of the client before the episode of care and at the end of episode of care. And, you know, that's something we've got a study going right now with a new tool that, that's doing that. And, you know, if, if you have somebody come in and their expectations are, I'm just doing this until I can get an injection, I don't think PT is going to do anything, that's a different um, client than somebody who comes in, my expectation is I'm going to get 60% pain relief with this. And the things that we assess are pain, um, emotional distress, if you will, and difficulty with tasks. And when one knows the profile of what the person's expectation, it's really interesting because sometimes, you know, as part of that question, we say, what do you expect? Um, and and their expectations at the end of the episode of care are really captured very nicely. And so I, you know, as part of the Macmillan, that's, that's something that we always did with individuals with spinal cord injury, because it, it helped um, gauge, because if the expectation is that they're going to walk and it's my best professional judgment that they're not going to, then we're, we're incongruent we have to get on the same page to work together. And so many episodes of care move forward without developing some uh, congruency between the provider and the, the patient. And so, you know, that was the area uh, related to that. And I'll just briefly um, come back to your um, ischemia model, because I, you know, that uh, blood flow restriction. Blood flow restriction is, is another great example of how we can turn on, if, if we understand the molecular pathways to hypertrophy, and we now know that there are 13 different molecular pathways to turn on protein synthesis, and the perfect storm to get it turned on is to get all 13 turned on. That means nutritional, signaling, hormonal signaling, overload, certain um, ischemia. Well, ischemia is just one of those signaling pathways. So, you know, my response would be ischemia is, is good in theory, as long as it's not viewed as the only pathway. So if somebody's not eating the right leucine or amino acids or taking in the right nutrition, and they're only using that signaling pathway, then it would be contrary to the global understanding that there are many pathways that we should be considering when we're trying to, let's say, hypertrophy the VMO or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, that is, I think this is a great follow-up question from uh, a student of ours, Fletcher, comment. How can we as physical therapists optimize our standard eight to 12 week insurance coverage window in order to get to get to provide the most amount of change on a cellular level in regards to muscle hypertrophy. Have you researched any types of frequency of strengthening that seems to bring about a higher amount of genetic change than others? Yeah, so, you know, we always think about hypertrophy, right? Um, and hypertrophy is important because that's the underlying basis for you know, muscle development and so forth. But we have to evaluate the client. And I'm going to, I'm going to say this in a way that it's a very complicated concept, but I'm going to make it fairly simple. Um, proteolysis or the breakdown of protein is as fundamentally important to the health of tissues as protein synthesis. And if a, if a system is not adequately breaking down, because it's, it's through, it's called autophagy, right? So when we break down bad proteins, there's a lot of misfolded proteins that go on and cause damage to tissues. And so, you know, it's not just always a matter of turning on synthesis. It's a matter of 
digesting the bad proteins that got spun off in the proteomics of a cell. A senescent cell, remember what senescence is. A senescent cell is a cell that stopped dividing, right? And it, um, it won't die, but it puts out a lot of protein secret secretory substances that damage other tissues. So in answer to that great question, um, you have to weigh what is the health of the person. So there's not a cookbook like, OK, this person has to do four times versus three times. You know, it depends on what their their digestive system is like. Some people don't digest protein well. Some people are on more um, plant based diets. Some people have. Um, um, gluten issues and some of the uh, complex carbohydrates are not being brought into the system. All those things have to be, you know, I mean, that's what makes our practice uncertain. And we shouldn't apologize for the ambiguity of medicine or the ambiguity of our practice. We need people who can tolerate ambiguity, be open thinkers and not want to put everything in a box. Because the minute you do, the next client comes in with a, you know, another condition. So for those reasons, I have not studied it. I think it'd be a great study. It's a great recommendation. But I think um, you have to control a lot of factors with that. All right. That's a great question. And in fact, I think we have a few uh, physical therapy students who have that t-shirt made on that <laughs> answer <laughs> with the, it depends, right? You're, I'm sure your students. <laughs> yes. Oh, you just basically elegantly said it depends. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, I, I, so we're going to pivot a little bit here in just a second. I, I really want to pivot to uh, your research on student debt. I think that's a crucial issue. And I know our students want to hear that. Um, but I do have a nice question in uh, the Q&A from Eric Toole, who's our uh, amazing health sciences library liaison here at Springfield College, who asks, what, what do you do to stay on top of current research? Uh, what are the strategies you have for managing the ever-expanding base of literature? And what do you recommend to students to do to stay uh, grounded in an evidence-based practice to keep that a reality? So my recommendation for students would be, I think the biggest loss of productive time is whenever you sit down to do something, if you haven't already thought about your plan. So in other words, sometimes we sit down and say, oh, what am I going to study? Uh, maybe I'll do the, you know, what you almost have to take Sunday night to say, okay, when I get an hour or two hours or have an opening here, this is, these are the materials. Um, I, you know, you put together your packet, just like you're a, a professor teaching a class. You know, you wouldn't go into a class and say, mm, uh, well, what are we going to cover today? Um, you know, I could do some of this. I could do some of that. You know, we actually outline a, a progression. So the, the progression is what I've found helps me the most. In other words, Sunday evening, I may put together my, my packets so that, you know, if I get open time, I might take in, you know, 20 minutes to figure out what I'm going to read, and then I lose time, right? So if packets are created and you're ready to, to go, then an opening occurs, okay, I just read that paper, you know, and it was more productive rather than, you know, restarting the wheel each time. And I try to make that point with our students as well. You know, uh, the planning of how you're going to consume literature is as important as actually reviewing it. So what is your strategy for reviewing it? Um, you know, like, okay, today I want to, I want to read about the microbiome on Thursday. And I've got that set up just to get a, an update. Here's a review article on it. And it, it kind of brings you up to speed that way. So that would be, you know, one recommendation. Um, but it, it is, I mean, it's a great question because it's really hard keeping up with everything. And you can't 
keep up with everything. But if you hit some key review articles and it, you don't have to keep up with everything if you get to think about what you're reading. You know, it's not the volume, it's how often are you really saying, well, that, I wonder about this or I wonder about something else, so. Sure. Well, we have a lot, you know, we, we're a private college. So uh, unlike uh, where you are at the University of Iowa with a lot of in-state students. Um, so I know for our students vitally, important is the, the question of student debt. And I wonder if some of our closing minutes here, we can really focus on um, your thoughts, but also your research into the student debt issue in physical therapy. Yeah, um, you know, student debt was always near and dear to my heart growing up when I went to school and so forth. And I tell the students, I went to Mayo and they paid me $200 a month. And so that's how times have changed. And, but I mean, deep down, um, you know, I don't tell, I, you know, I tell students, don't panic. You're going to, you're going to be okay. Um, why? Because you're resourceful. You know how to put in a, a good day's work. And if push comes to shove, you're going to, you're going to be fine financially. The reason I wrote that paper and the reason that we're now doing a multi-centered trial and debt um, and all outcomes in physical therapy is I wanted to impress upon those who were looking at physical therapy as a revenue generator for other departments. And by doing that, bringing the profession down. And by bringing it down, I mean, you know, if, if, if you have such a debt load, then you're restricted on where you may be able to go practice. And so for those reasons, I wanted to calculate the net present value of the physical therapy degree and do some comparison with medicine, since we are in medicine and occupational therapy, veterinary medicine, and that's what's in the paper. And I have to say, that the paper served its purpose in that, you know, when people say, well, what can we do? I think we're doing it. We're talking about it. It's okay to talk about debt and it, because it's a re reality. And, you know, it also gets into the hearts and minds of those decision makers who can so easily increase a cost just by, well, let's go up 3% this year without any consideration as to what it might mean to a great profession like physical therapy. And I think about the strength of diversity in our field and how the rising costs really, um, you know, push us away from, from being more diverse. And, um, you know, I saw what, what cost did to medicine when I was you know, in school and why I shied away from it because it was just like, I could never. And it was like $12,000 for medical school then. But I was just so enamored with, oh my gosh, you know, that it scared people away that would have been good for medicine. And so um, I don't want to be in at the point that we're, we're losing good people because of, um, exorbitant costs. I can say that that paper went viral and I got contacted by over 30 deans across the country who interestingly enough said, we had no idea. I, I, oh, this yeah. really opened the door because I oversee these programs and we had no idea that, that the, the value of the degree could be um, influencing that profession in the future. And many of them started to, you know, lower costs and so forth. So um, that was, and I, and I think value, economics has to be in the denominator of value. And as we build benchmarks and we, we try to improve our academic programming, you know, it is, um, cost is, is gonna be a factor. So, we put that in our um, strategic plan in 2008. And, um, you know, fortunately here, I have control of tuition. So I can, 
I've frozen it for seven straight years. And I would love every physical therapy department to have that ability to do what's best for the department. Um, but I know that's, that's challenging, so. Well, I think on that note, I'm a little over the one hour mark. And uh, as a, a student myself of Dr. Gary Soderberg, I was in his first class at Creighton University. Um, ah. I want to thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it over for uh, one last question or two from Dr. Shevin, because especially that student debt issue and ability to, ability to control costs, I know is obviously of utmost most concerned to her. So I really enjoyed spending time with you, um, but I'm going to turn it back over to our grand poobah, Dr. Shevin. Thank you, Angel. <laughs> Thanks, Angel. That was great. And, and thank you again, Dr. Shields. This has been a, a phenomenal, you know, view of your life as a researcher and the breadth of the work that you do. It's been really exciting to hear about everything from epigenetics and cells to student debt. And I know that you're continuing on the path with the student debt. We are one of the sites of the benchmarks trial. And uh, I'm, I'm really curious about how many more sites are coming in and where you think that, how do you think that data is gonna change physical therapy education? Yeah, I think that's really a good question. I, you know, I think right at the outset, um, benchmarks relative to our peers immediately helps us to um, self-assess. I mean, it, 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 when I write a self-report, for me to, to make it only on metrics that I've put together without knowing how others are doing would be like, um, you know, we know that the V.02 of people in their 60s is here's excellent, here's, you know, average, and here's very poor. And so by having that data, I can, I can do an oxygen consumption study and say, you know what, I'm, I'm really, I got to watch out. I mean, we're, for whatever reason, we're, I'm not very conditioned aerobically. And so the same thing, it's, it's the health of academic programs. When you can look at a metric and say, oh my gosh, um, we're at the highest uh, standard deviation or we're, we're at the highest percentile in this metric. I never knew that's a signature of our program. Whereas I might look at, at a low score and say, geez, or I can explain why that lower benchmark exists. And I don't, you know, I know we get into heavy discussions about what is excellence and all that, but you know, it all has to start with just measuring what our consumers think. And that's the students, the graduate. Just like if, if, if we say, well, it doesn't matter what the patient thinks, we're not, you know, we're not going down the right path. And so, I think the student-based or not student, but graduate, that's why it's the graduate questionnaire. At the time that they're ready to graduate and they know they're graduating, they're very honest about the program. And we've always gotten that data, but we don't know how it compares across institutions. And in answer to your question, we're, we're approaching a hundred institutions. Oh. So in fact, 20 requests came in today. So our next phase is um, up, updating our hardware so that we can seamlessly produce the reports and, and um, do it in that fashion. And along those lines, I, I think it's healthy for it to be done under research uh, guise and research guidelines because it protects, um, you know, it protects the data in the same way we to protect patient data in randomized control trials through NIH funded work. And, you know, I think that's an important piece. Thank you. And, and, and we will be, I, there are about 30 some odd students in the audience today who are happily gonna be getting their survey at some point in May and participating. They don't know it yet, but this is the first they've heard about it. And I'm also very excited about the idea because again, you're, what you're talking about is we need the data. 
we can collect the data. We've got the students. This is an opportunity for all of us to actually look at ourselves in a way that we haven't before. And I'm hoping that at some point, I know I've already sent you a couple of messages about this, that the data gets opened up to other researchers who can dig into it and ask other questions about it. Yeah, and I, I think that's really the key to keeping it as an, as an academic arm and not as a revenue generating arm. And I say that from the standpoint that, you know, I mean, I look at the CPI and we pay X amount for it every year, but we don't have any data. Mm. But, but if, if that was housed in an academic institution with a clear research mission, I would venture to say the CPI would have been spinning off a lot of aggregated benchmarks for us, right? But yeah. so yeah. That's, that's why I like it going down you know, and, and I deal with the genomic data, there's 20,000 genes. And when you get to epigenetics, there's 656,000 per person. So these benchmarks for education are just more data, you know, and so it's an analysis process. So right. I'm excited. Looking at our genes. Yeah, looking I, at our physical therapy program genes. Yeah, and and I really think, I know you didn't think you were brave by participating, <laughs> but I really think, I think that group was extremely brave because it's always, you know, it, there's always a risk that you learn something that you didn't know you would learn. And, and I think, you know, that inaugural group, I think was really um, very, um, unselfish to say, yeah, we, we, we need these and let's, let's do it. So that's why the brave thing came up. <laughs> well, thank you. And I think everyone, hopefully at some point, will learn a little bit more about the concept of brave when that next publication comes yeah. out. Yes. So we want to thank you. We want to thank you for your time, for your generosity of spirit, for being our green lecturer. It's been fantastic. Uh, I'm sure that it's gonna generate conversation in the classes and conversation on, on some of our, our learning management system boards. And you will always henceforth be getting an invitation to the Green Lecture. Now that said, what I do at the end of the Green Lecture each year is not only thank the, 20, the, the current Green Lecture, our 2021, but announce the 2022 Green Lecture. Wow. And I'm very excited about our 2022 lecture because our 2022 <laughs> lecture is Terry Ellis. Now, Terry is, uh, Dr. Ellis is the as associate professor and chair of the Department of Physical Therapy and Athletic Training at Boston University. And for the students in the audience, I just want you to take a quick look at where she got her bachelor's degree. Yes. May 1987. So Terry was in our very first uh, uh, class that graduated in the master's program back when we were master's program in physical therapy at Springfield College. And that was May, 1988. We're excited to have her come back next year. And uh, Dr. Shields, invite you to return. Um, I hope that we're not gonna be doing it virtual, but if we are, I'll be sure to extend the invitation to you. And if we're doing it live, we'll probably have a, a concurrent virtual presentation. This time. So thank you for your time. Thank you for the evening. Thank you to all the attendees for joining us in a really wonderful Green Lecture 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. all.